Yo, what's up Giants fans, hub watchers, YouTube subscribers, Twitter and Instagram followers. It's No Name here with the next uh, subscriber selected video. This is from a group of comments, you know, from a couple weeks ago that had multiple comments I wanted to address and make a vid on. Uh, this was the one you guys voted for this week. Five players the Giants could trade for. And I have to say, I must admit, this was the most difficult video I've ever had to make when it comes to like actually coming up uh, with players that the Giants could trade for. I even said it in the post. I'm not sure if I could find five and I didn't find five. I only got four here compiled for y'all, but I think it's okay. You know, last time I did a four player list like this, it was the if they were going to sign any free agents, five free agents, they could still sign. And a month later, two of those four players that I mentioned um, in Justin Britt and Demarius Thomas, I mean, there are names being thrown around right now as players that the Giants could sign and you know I'm, I'm gonna take a little bit of credit for that I, nobody was really talking about Justin Britt before I brought him up but enough about that this one was much harder the trade market is way more difficult to predict and really the only reliable thing I went off of was players that were franchise tagged this offseason and that were also franchise tagged either for monetary reasons or the team seemed like they may not want to keep them in the future and so that was the only the only kind of players that i had on this list the ones that are franchise tag because i can't really try and predict something like a trade out of nowhere about a player that just was on a regular contract and all of a sudden i don't know internal problems that i don't know about causes them to be shipped off so there's that and then also uh, a huge disclaimer that must be said when it comes to the monetary concern here how will these players be compensated once they're actually on the giants because you think about the giants cap space and whatnot I will just ask y'all to suspend your disbelief a little bit because that's really the only way this vid would actually work. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't have done it at all because I'm not sure either. I mean, the things I could think about was, uh, for example, when I have a wide receiver on the list, I'm like, okay, we probably let go of Golden Tate or Golden Tate is somehow off the team or something like that. And for a defensive player, Leonard Williams, or maybe there's another way that Giants could work around it. But just suspend your disbelief a little bit and let's get into the video. So the first player on the list that the Giants could look into potentially trading for is Ravens edge rusher Matthew Judon. So like I said in the beginning, the players on this list are all on the franchise tags for their respective team and one of the reasons I mentioned was that the team might not have enough money to sign them to a long term deal and Matt Judon is one of those players. He is the starting edge rusher for the Ravens and has been the starting edge rusher, one of the starting edge rushers. For the Ravens since the 2017 season and since being put in that position Matt Judon as a fifth round pick has definitely excelled in his time with the Baltimore Ravens notching up at least seven sacks in each season since 2017 with the only reason in 2016 that he had only four was once again because he was a rotational player at then and he had his career high nine and a half sacks last year along with 54 combined tackles and 11 assisted and another career high in quarterback hits with 33. Judon did this while playing 81% of the defensive snaps, which was another career high once again because even though he was already a starter at this point in 2019, uh, for the Ravens, Judon was really one of their only good defensive players left after that 2018 offseason where guys like CJ Mosley and whatnot left the team because of similar issues the fact that the Ravens can sign him to a long-term contract Judon was kind of thrust into that position of being a leader and being one of the defensive standouts on the team and he well he stepped into it Judon is only currently 27 years old and that is still pretty young for a defensive end in the league once again that is his position defensive end but I believe he can play outside linebacker he definitely has the body type and pass rushing ability to excel at either outside linebacker or defensive end and as I've said for the entirety of the offseason as you guys already know with the Giants defense looking to be a more fluid and versatile one this offseason they're going to be running 4-3 and 3-4 sets he's probably going to be in there for most of those if he ends up on the team that is you know of course only if he ends up on the team and he'll he'll do fine in both both versions of the scheme and he's only 27 now for some of y'all that might not be too young you might say ah he's close to 30 and whatnot well for a defensive end an edge rusher a pass rusher in football they along with quarterbacks tend to play some of the more longer careers in the nfl defensive ends really can play up to 15 maybe even 20 years i mean look at one of the greatest giants ever in michael strahan who had one of the one of the longer careers in the nfl so he's still developing, he's still in his prime, and he can get even better than he is right now. 
One other thing I do hope that he brings to the team or whatever team he ends up on for that uh, matter is the leadership that he showed while on the Ravens. I mean, you never heard anything bad about him and I do hope that he could teach young pass rushers that we have on the Giants, you know, guys like Carter and Zimenez, he can teach them some tips and tricks, help them learn, help them improve, and even help them be better locker room idols. Now here's the thing with Judon though, the franchise tag was placed on him because the Ravens don't have enough money to sign him, is that they don't have enough money to sign him to the contract that he wants. He does believe that he should be paid as a top tier pass rusher, which is around like that 18 to 20 million dollar deal. And while he's on the franchise tag right now for around 16 million dollars, I do believe if the Ravens gave him say 60 million dollars for four years or something, he'll happily agree to it. It's just that Judon is not that top tier pass rusher, you know, he's very good. He's in probably that second tier of pass rushers, but he's not great. He's not the Khalil Max of the world. And he certainly, I think, uh, knows that he's not the Khalil Max of the world. Maybe they were just starting off high with negotiations as you usually do. Whatever the case is right now between Judon, you know, Judon's agent and the Ravens, there's currently a stalemate between the two of them. They're not seeming to come to a sort of contract agreement. And even if they were able to do so, I think the Ravens only have somewhere like 7 million in uh, cap space right now so the franchise tag was the way to go for them they could be looking to you know trade him and maybe get him off the team to get that headache away or maybe they'll try and insure him up who knows but Matt Judon the first person on this list moving on to number two I got uh, Bengals wide receiver AJ Green Green of course the former fourth overall pick for the Cincinnati Bengals coming out in 2011 as one of the uh, most touted wide receiver prospects in NFL history. A lot of people forget this. AJ Green was actually the number one wide receiver coming out of high school and college ahead of Julio Jones. Julio definitely proved his stuff in the NFL though and I think to this point in their careers it's definitely no competition between who the better wide receiver is. AJ Green certainly is a Hall of Fame wide receiver. He will get in there eventually. But he didn't really, you know, it's no comparison when you compare the two. But that's not what we're here to talk about. AJ Green was in his prime a top 10, even top 5 wide receiver. But his career really got derailed by injuries. And to be honest, a bit of lackluster play by the quarterback. And also being stuck on a terrible team and organization that is the Cincinnati Bengals. Couldn't really help him out um, in his latter years in the NFL. Now, the dude has missed around 29 games in the past four years, which is not something to look forward to. However, coming off of his most recent injury where he missed the entirety of the 2019 season, Green has actually put even more steps into rehab and taken a lot more time for that rehab because he was supposed to return in the midway of the 2019 season around uh, week eight, you know, around that halfway point in the season. His doctor recommended that he did not as there was still some swelling in his ankle he said okay and he took extra eight weeks the rest of the season and then he took even extra months as we're talking here right now the offseason he should return and be fully healthy in 2020. now the last time the nfl saw green in 2018 he only played nine games where he had uh 77 targets 46 receptions and 694 yards with six touchdowns but the last time he was fully healthy in the nfl which was in 2017 um, and that year the Bengals did do better I will say there's a correlation there uh, where he did start all 16 games and play in all 16 games he had 143 targets 75 receptions and 1078 yards with eight touchdowns so it's definitely at least in you know the last time we saw him when playing all games he can definitely still be a thousand yard receiver that's not what I'm asking him to be though I'm not asking him to be a thousand yard receiver I'm not asking him to even be what he was in his prime which was a top five receiver in the NFL I'm not asking him to be that number one receiver on a playoff, you know, a consistent playoff team in the Bengals, which they were from like, what, uh, 2013 to 2016 or something like that. That's not what we're asking him to do at this point in his career. And it's certainly not what the Bengals are also asking him to do, which is why they placed the franchise tag on him. Green is definitely looking for money similar to his draft mate in Julio Jones. But I think he's definitely beginning to understand that he's not worth that because while he stated beforehand that he's not willing to play on the franchise tag, he then retracted that statement and went on to say that it would be foolish to turn down the amount of money he's getting for the franchise tag, which I think is around $18 million for the wide receiver position. So I think he's definitely slowly coming to terms with the fact that, you know, his days in the NFL are definitely numbered, probably got a couple more years left, and he's not worth the money he was initially demanding. But the Bengals have more than enough cap space to extend him, even if he did want that say 18 20 million dollar deal the Bengals have 
over 20 million dollars available in cash days, which suggests that maybe they are not looking to keep him around definitely puts him up on the trading block here and if he were come to the giants once again i'm not asking him to be number one I, in fact i'm asking him to be number three or number four just like in my free agents video i was saying the marius thomas somebody with former number one wide receiver type of experience very similar situation here can't really stay healthy if you if they're coming over they're gonna be number three or number four and they should 100 percent eight be able to excel in that spot because they're not gonna have number one corners on them and whatnot and they should 100 percent be able to stay healthy because they're not gonna get as much targets as they did in their heyday and they should definitely be able to teach our younger receiver in darius slayton who is now the outside threat um teach him a lot on how to be a good player and a good teammate so aj green is the next person i had on the list and once again this is where the whole thing i was telling you guys talking about suspending the disbelief a little bit um i it's not exactly something i expect to happen i think it's going to be completely out of left field if it does and this one for sure if he comes on the giants are going to have to let go of one golden tape because you're going to have two old receivers on the team and you'll be replacing golden tape with a reliable one in uh AJ Green in terms of having reliable hands when he's on the field. So once again, you know, just keep in mind, suspend the disbelief a little bit just because there's not that many players on the trading block right now for the NFL and I can't really, nobody can really predict who's going to get traded unless they have this franchise tag on them. Which uh, brings me to the next player on the list, coming in at the number two spot, he was actually the last player I added to the list, the defensive tackle slash defensive end from the Kansas City Chiefs, Chris Jones. That's just one arrow I would absolutely love to have, especially as a replacement for one Leonard Williams. It would be Chris Jones. Coming off of that rookie contract, taken in the second round of that 2016 draft, pick 37, and over the course of his NFL career thus far is performing like a first round pick. The dude each year that he spent the NFL improved um, as the years went along, going from two sacks in 2016 to six and a half to 2017 to the monster by far his best year in 2018 with 15 and a half sacks with 15 and a half sacks and 29 quarterbacks quarterback hits surprisingly did not get a pro bowl appearance out of that and uh, people can definitely make the argument that he was helped out by D Ford who also had a good year in 2018 but Kansas City fans remained uh, I guess you could say solid with Chris Jones and believed in him after D Ford was traded to the 49ers and they did believe and they ch definitely chose right he definitely maintained a great season as a pass rusher from the inside of the defensive line with nine sacks in 2019 not as you know completely astounding as 15 and a half but nine sacks from an interior defensive lineman is incredible now his tackle numbers did decrease a bit in 2019 going from 40 total to 36 and from 19 tackles for loss to just eight but i will try to attribute some of that to also a scheme change or you know that the kansas city chiefs went through their new defense coordinator in 2019 being steve spagnolo and maybe chris jones was uh, adjusting to that either way still a really great season from once again an interior defensive lineman this is the direction that the nfl is heading in where basically anybody on the defensive line can get to the quarterback of course the prime example of defensive linemen you know the interior guys getting to the quarterback would be who is the best player in the nfl right now and aaron donald for the rams but a lot more and more defensive tackles you're seeing them moving towards this position and if you can't get to the quarterback from the inside of defensive line at this point in the nfl you're probably not going to be considered you know somebody that a team would really want for you that much nose tackles are kind of i don't want to say going extinct but they're being used more than just to stuff the run now and chris jones would definitely be a welcome addition to the giants i said he would be the perfect replacement for leonard williams and i mean that because leonard williams was supposed to be that guy for us the compliment to dexter lawrence who looks to be at least in some capacity a pass rushing defensive tackle along with being a great run stuffer uh Leonard Williams was supposed to be that guy that gets to the quarterback from the inside and Chris Jones is definitely better than him I'll tell you what Chris Jones in my opinion is a top five interior defensive lineman Leonard Williams is not and Jones has certainly proven that he could get to the quarterback consistently over the past two or three years and these are two players right now that are playing on or not playing on but that are on the same franchise tag both of them are currently on the defensive tackle franchise tag and I think we can all agree that Chris Jones is a lot more deserving of that than Leonard Williams is. Now, there does seem to be some tension between uh, Chris Jones and the Kansas City Chiefs. Uh, they've been working 
on a deal like everybody else on the list for basically the entirety of the offseason to no avail. I wouldn't say they've reached a stalemate as much as it seems like Chris Jones just does not want to play on the franchise tag. He even took to Twitter at one point saying that if he, but you know, by the time the season rolls around and he's still on the tag, he might sit out. He doesn't want to play on it. And then, you know, he even tagged Le'Veon Bell saying that, you know, he learned it from Bell. He doesn't want the team to really just sort of use him on a contract that doesn't give him any type of job security and whatnot. And he is looking for that top tier pay. Now, I did say I think of him as one of the best defensive tackles in the league. But when it comes to pay and compensation now, uh, with every position in the league, I don't think um, anybody is really worth being paid $20 million to be on the defensive line. But that's just my personal opinion. The reality of the situation is no matter what team he ends up with, he will get that amount of money because he is a top five player at his position. And whether you like it or not, that's just the way to... The NFL market works right now. Your top five of your position, and if your contract time is up, you're going to get that next big contract. And like I said before, he's earned the next contract, just not so sure how much. But Chris Jones would be an absolute force on this defense. I think without a doubt, he'll be the leading uh, sack leader, the leading pass rusher. He'll have a ton of talent and expertise to add to that defensive line, which is already a strong one and will be an upgrade uh, from Leonard Williams, believe you me. And that only just helps out the linebacking core and everybody else on the defense. So the last person I have on the list that the Giants could try and trade for, and this was somebody that it's probably the most realistic out of everybody on the list. And it's somebody that was very popular at the beginning of free agency in the off season, it's died down since then. Jaguars defensive end, Yannick Ngakwe. Of the relationship that any player on this list has with their respective team that they're on right now and that they have the tag with right now, Yannick has like the worst relationship with the Jaguars compared to anybody else on this list. He by far just straight up does not want to play for them, does not want to beat there anymore, and the relationship has really soured over the course of the last year. Um, to keep it short, I think it started back in last year's offseason when he was looking for a $20 million deal and the Jaguars actually offered him a $19 million deal. So just $1 million off. If I was him, I would have taken it, but he did not sign it, which in my opinion is a clear sign that he just did, didn't want to be with Jacksonville. He ended up playing for the Jaguars last year for around $2 million. Then you talk about earlier this offseason, he got into a, a fight on Twitter with uh, the, the senior vice president of the Jaguars and whatnot. Listen, long story short, he just does not want to beat it, even though the Jaguars still want him. And even though, in my opinion, after the 2020 draft where they took Caleb on chase on, they've clearly moved on from him. They got two good first round pass rushers in Josh Allen from last year and Caleb on chase on from this year to replace um, Yannick Ngakwe. And then Gakwe, of course, he's not, I'm not going to be out here to try and say this dude is the greatest defensive end out there in the NFL right now. He's not top five. I think he's arguably top 10 at his position, maybe a fringe top 10 player. Last year, he uh, came out in the season totaling eight sacks, 41 total tackles, 13 tackles for loss, 15 quarterback hits, which is a decrease from 2018, where he had nine and a half sacks. Uh, he did have less total tackles with 28, but more quarterback hits with 33 and definitely even uh, a decrease from 2017. But 2017, of course, the, the entire Jaguars defense was just playing out of their minds where Yannick had 12 sacks that year. But I'm definitely, I think it would be foolish not to consider the fact that the dude doesn't want to be in Jacksonville, that that was a factor for a lack in his performance last year. And to me personally, Yannick, he's a good player. He's a really good player. He's more than above average. He's really good in the pass and the run, but it's it's crazy because there's a split amongst fans that have actually watched his tape. You got people saying that he's a glorified run stuffer that could only get to the quarterback on every now and then plays. And then you got people saying that he's a glorified uh, or actually saying that he's not good in the run and he only gets to the quarterback on such and such basis, kind of like the opposites i do think he's good enough in both of them and 100 uh he's better than what the giants currently have at the outside linebacker position speaking of which kind of like matt judon i fully believe that yannick can play as an outside linebacker if asked to do so and he'll definitely will be able to succeed in a fluid type system that would have him playing at both positions at different times during the game now there was a reason many giants fans were very interested in this guy at the beginning of the offseason let's not all pretend 
that like maybe 89% of y'all wanted this dude on the team just a couple months ago. One of the main reasons was his age. He's very, very young and he has a lot more room to grow. The dude is only 20, 25 years old, not even 26. He's only 25 years old. He has a lot of room to grow. He hasn't even entered his prime as a pass rusher yet. Remember what I said, pass rushers, man, they live long in the NFL, bro. This dude has at least 10 to 12 years more remaining in the NFL. He can certainly get onto a new team with a change of scenery maybe even improve from what he did last year and once again he's a good enough pass rusher last year and he'll be able to come on to a team where he'll automatically be the number one pass rusher and hopefully develop into one of the great number one pass rushers of the league even if he doesn't do so he'll be a very reliable number one pass rusher very similar to actually what Matt Judon became for the Ravens the you know the first guy Hunt had on this list he can be for the Giants what Matt Judon was from the Ravens somebody taken in the mid to later rounds that just became a reliable number one pass rusher that can get to the quarterback and is good enough in the run game there are drawbacks to him though like I am actually I'm not sure about his character when looking at the whole situation between him and Jacksonville, I'm hard pressed to stand on his side. I am definitely leaning a bit more on Jacksonville's side. They definitely handled the situation a bit more civilly. At least that's the way it's been painted by the media. That's the way I, it looks to me. But when it, when it comes to the whole Twitter thing and the, the, the conversation more so like the argument he had with Tony Khan, I, I would completely be on Jacksonville's side. They've been very, very, uh, you know, safe about the way they've spoken to Yannick in public and whatnot. And from all accounts, he just doesn't want to be on the team anymore because he doesn't see a future with the Jaguars. He doesn't see the Jaguars going anywhere successful in the near future. So he wants to get on a team that probably has a brighter one. So I, I can't understand that. But what I can't get on board with is the way that he's handled the situation. It just kind of looked childish. So from a leadership standpoint, I don't know if Yannick Ngakwe would exactly be the best person to have on your team. But he is the most likely to get traded to the Giants, if anywhere, in my opinion. He's been connected to the Giants ever since uh, the dude's essentially been franchise tagged. And once again, because of the relationship with the Jaguars, just in general to get traded, he's the most likely candidate. But that's the list I got for y'all today. I hope you guys were able to suspend your disbelief a little bit. Maybe you didn't even need to for some of the players such as Yannick. Let me know what you think. Is there any players you would add on to this list? Once again, very difficult to come up with because trades are a lot more uh, hard to predict and I really just had to rely on the players that were franchise tagged this year put your comments down below Let me know what you all think and I am out Thanks for watching don't forget to like comment subscribe and share I'll catch y'all in the next one